privilege of meeting Shasti last summer during the 2017 Oxfam Change Leader Training in Boston. So the Oxfam Change Initiative is a program that brings together college students from around the country to learn about Oxfam campaigns and strategies of fundraising and advocating for various social justice issues. So Shasti was a change leader in 2007 and came back for the 2017 training to share some of her wisdom with us on starting an Oxfam club at her college campus and later pursuing a career in social justice advocacy. I was immediately drawn to her story and made a point to maintain contact soon after because of how strongly I admired all that she had accomplished at such a young age. So upon graduating from Seattle University in 2008, Shasti went to work as a field organizer on the Obama presidential campaign. Immediately afterwards, she went to work as an assistant to senior advisor Valerie Jarrett at the White House, where she managed key stakeholders such as the special assistant to the president for disability policy and the briefings manager for the president, first lady, and vice president. In 2015, Shasti received her master's in public affairs in international development at Princeton. While at Princeton, Shasti was a senior graduate fellow at the Malala Fund, where she traveled to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony with Malala and her family. Shasti provided programmatic support and logistical management for the Malala Fund. Furthermore, she was the co-chair of the Students and Alumni of Color Network at Princeton, where she did key work with the dean of the university to make both the admissions recruitment process and curriculum of the master's program more diverse and inclusive. In 2015, Shasti was the chief operating officer for Sozi Productions, a creative social impact agency focused on social justice campaigns. Then she went to work on the national advance team for the Senator Bernie Sanders 2016 presidential campaign. She also ran for elected office, finishing third out of eight candidates for Washington State Senate's 37th legislative district. Currently, Shasti is the U.S. campaign manager and regional planning advisor for the 100 million campaign, which aims to be the largest youth mobilization in history to end child labor and trafficking. This campaign was launched and is headed by Kailash Satyarthi, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014 alongside Malala. Please join me in welcoming an incredible activist, a pioneer in bringing diversity to institutional positions, and a key advocate for social justice issues across U.S. politics. Studies here, and <laughs> um, we're going to try to make this a conversation. So I have a, a, a few questions for Shasti, but I, we were thinking it might be nice if you guys just jump in wherever you would like. If there are questions, if there are things that you'd like clarified more, just you know, raise your hand. There's a mic. We ask because this is being filmed that, that uh, you speak into the mic. But other than that, uh, it would be really nice to make this as much of a collective endeavor as possible. So um, Shasti, I guess I wanted to frame this by saying you've worked with three very different kinds of Nobel laureates. And, and I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about the constraints and possibilities that each offered for change. Um, and maybe throw Bernie Sanders in there, too, <laughs> and say another change agent, mm -hmm. right, and, and a different strategy mm -hmm. uh, for promoting change through electoral politics. So um, yeah, let's start with that frame and, and mm -hmm. see where we go. Getting to work with these major change agents who had developed um, a platform for their particular causes. And as I sort of look back onto their different um, characteristics, their personalities, the way that they do their work, I think the, the most common thread is that they all have a really strong sense of self. They have spent the time to really get to know who they are, what makes them special, and what also what's their purpose, what's their calling. They've all taken that time to really to really figure that out. And for some of those people, it happened over time. I think both for President Obama and for Kailash, they, they came to those causes and to that purpose through self-reflection, through, um, through working on in different projects in different areas. And Malala, I think it was, it was very much thrust in that she happened to be on her school bus in Pakistan. And all of a sudden, she's confronted with a geopolitical crisis, which is the Taliban. The Taliban got under her school bus and shot her point blank. And all of a sudden, she is thrust into the limelight um, and suddenly sort of becomes this, this beacon and has this platform. So I think you know there's different ways that all three of them came into their positions to be able to have that platform. But all of them have recognized the value in being able to use their stories, their voices, to talk about a larger cause, to do the work 
Um, and all of them have been able to have strong personalities, but that have led to a social movement that is so much bigger than just each one of them. And they've used that sort of people power to then affect institutional changes. They've all tackled um, institutions, whether, you know, President Obama, obviously, domestically in the United States, but both Kailash and Malala, you know, have, have lobbied the UN, have worked with the um, Kailash, um, led the global march, which resulted in the ILO Convention 182, which was against child labor. And Malala, you know, has become this sort of global force for girls' education. So all of them have figured out how to do that positioning to be able to both inspire folks on the ground to create this kind of um, tidal wave of action, um, but also channel that into, into real policy change and institutional change. For the President of the United States would enable you to have the greatest impact, um, but there are constraints, obviously, to mm -hmm. working in a situation like the White House and in a city like Washington, D.C. So I wondered if you would speak both about, first of all, about how you ended up so young mm -hmm. in that position in the White House, um, but then secondly, because I suspect there are some Rocky students who might be interested in that, that path, but secondly, uh, to talk about then again, what you what you felt like you were able to accomplish in that position, and 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 what not? What mm -hmm. were your frustrations? Mm -hmm. Well, I was a senior in college when a young Barack Obama announced that he was running for president, and I had actually was working on a project for my sociology thesis um, related to sort of political participation and how to get young people, and particularly young people of color, involved in the political process. And he declared in the middle of that research, it was like literally <laughs> that year that he, he came yeah. forward. And it you know, radically changed my research and it radically changed the country. And, um, and what it was was that he was, he was different. He represented this segment of the population that had so rarely seen themselves reflected both you know, sort of in mainstream media and you know this platform and just also at the table also in decision making processes they hadn't seen someone like that um, and I was really drawn to him because I had read his book The Audacity of Hope and um, I'm adopted from India I was raised by a single Caucasian mother in Oregon a small town in Oregon mm. and so when I read The Audacity of Hope I immediately felt this connection to him I felt like someone understood that feeling of not fitting in all the time, sort of also dealing with that within your own family, trying to understand who you are in this larger picture, how that could make an impact. And I really, it really spoke to me and I just wanted to be a part of it. I just wanted to help him. And I always like to remind folks, like, we weren't supposed to win. We weren't the, we weren't right. the bet, you know? <laughs> we, we were running against a very strong candidate, Hillary Clinton, and she was most likely going to be the nominee. And so I just did it because I believed in him. And then we won, <laughs> and that meant that I had the opportunity to get to go to the White House. And a friend of mine had been working on the campaign and went to go set up the internship program, and, and she called me and she said, I think you should try for this. And I think over 6,000 people applied, and 100 interns were chosen, and I was the first class of summer interns mm -hmm. um, in the Obama administration, and I worked in the Office of Urban Affairs. And you know, I had grown up on the West Coast. I'd grown up in Oregon, in a town of 15,000 people. I went to Seattle University, which is a Jesuit school, but also about 4,000 undergrads. So not huge, um, and hadn't spent much time on the East Coast. So it was my first experience of really seeing what it was like to be in the you know hallways of power, right? And these people who come from backgrounds like Dartmouth and, and Harvard and Yale and Princeton. And, um, and, I, and I saw that there were opportunities that they had had previously that I had not. Um, and so getting to be in the White House was both sort of personally um, fascinating and a very steep learning curve, but a very quick um, sort of fast paced thrown into the fire and, and see sort of see what comes out of it. Um, and there was so much energy. I, you know, I always like to go back to that time because we were so hopeful. Yeah. We weren't supposed to win. This young man, you know, had was beaming and he was charming and he, you know, campaigned on hope. And then we won and were there. And I mean, there was just so much energy around that. And then we got to the White House, and it was difficult. <laughs> and there were a lot of people who had never, never worked in government like that. Many of the staffers who had been on the campaign were also in their early 20s um, and who were now in senior roles in the White House and were figuring it out. We didn't know where the phones were in the first couple of days, you know, basic things like that. 
And so the constraints were really, it was a steep learning curve. I think, um, I think the healthcare debate was, is proof of that learning curve. I think that the president came in thinking that he had a reasonable proposal, that he had had the mandate, he'd had the public mandate that people wanted universal health care, that this was solving a problem. And then he got to Washington, D.C., and he suddenly had to grapple with policymakers who had been entrenched in D.C. politics for decades, who had their own battles, their own um, supporters, their own lobbyists, and it wasn't as simple as I think he initially thought. And we spent a lot of political capital. Um, one of the great lessons I learned was I, was, I saw the first draft of the health care bill, and it included the public mandate, it included mm. a public option, um, and to watch that bill get r torn apart and stripped and stripped and stripped to the point where it might be able to pass by just one or two votes and how hard that battle was and how much political capital was spent to get to something that not really anybody loved <laughs> um, and how painful that process was um, really taught me kind of how DC works. And the idea, what I kept hearing at that time, the refrain was, well, we'll fix it later. Like, we just have to pass something and then we'll add to it later. The problem is that we had spent so much political capital that later never really came. Mm -hmm. And you see now, you know, in the Trump era, it was the first thing they tried to get rid of. It's the first thing they tried to destroy. Um, and so just trying to make that little bit of change, it takes, it takes every person <laughs> pulling all the various levers to be able to try to get one little thing passed. And that was every single day there was something like that that we were trying to get done, and that was very difficult. I want to stay in the halls of power, or did you move, feel like you're going to move to a different direction for mm -hmm. making change? My internship was just over the summer, and I was supposed to go to graduate school because my mentors had all been college professors. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the thought of like a good life would be to go to a university and write and research. Yeah. And, um, and so I was enrolled in a PhD program for sociology. And I uh, got to Washington, D.C., and was just in awe of the opportunities. I was in awe of President Obama and his staff. And um, it just, you know, I was, I was 23 years old. You know, <laughs> I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and, and so I just thought, I, whatever I can do, I want to stay. I just want to try to stay. And so I worked really hard. And um, finally, a job opened up in, officially in the Office of Public Engagement. So I became the assistant to the special assistant to the president on disability policy and then was promoted seven months later to work for Valerie Jarrett, who was the president's best friend and um, chief advisor. Uh, and so then I just, I, I just worked for about two and a half years and tried to do what I could to support the work that was happening. Um, I then decided to leave to go on the 2012 campaign because I wanted to make sure that we had another term. And I did that and spent a year in Chicago um, doing that. And by that point, at the end of the campaign, we won, which was great, um, but it had been a lot. And I had been, in, I'd been sort of in the trenches for about five years at that point. And I felt like I needed to, I needed to sort of go in a different direction. I wanted to have a more global perspective to the work that I was doing. So I decided to go to graduate school. So my form of a break was to go to Princeton <laughs> and to go to graduate school. Um, but in part because, you know, it was going to be two years where I was going to be able to invest in my own brain. And I was going to be able to really have the space and the time to think about policy innovations and solutions. And, you know, I, I realized I kind of did it backwards. I got thrown into an environment where we were doing the work, mm -hmm. but I was missing the foundation. And so I decided to go back to graduate school in part to try to understand what I had just lived through. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's what sort of pushed me to then go to graduate school, which was there where um, I met Malala while I was at graduate school. Let's move on to Malala. So very different scenario, as young as Obama was. Mm -hmm. right? He was in his 40s. He was very much a grown man. <laughs> yeah. um, here you have a 15-year-old girl who is you know, victimized in this particularly brutal and traumatic way. Um, tell us a little bit about how you see her stepping onto the world stage together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, working for Malala was transformative. I actually learned a great deal from just simply being in her presence. Um, and I was, when I was working with her, I was almost twice her age. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, to see such a young uh, woman, young person with um, that strong 
also like Obama, very, very stable, very grounded, um, and a fearlessness. And one of the big lessons I learned working with Malala was, you know, for all intents and purposes, she was she should have died. I mean, to have been shot in the head point blank like that, there, to survive it, I mean, the chances are probably less than 1%. Mm. Um, and I think there's something really freeing that happened with the fact that she survived. I think you, and actually, she faced her fear, she faced her fear of death, and then has been living on borrowed time. And I think she recognizes that that means that every day is a gift, mm -hmm. every day is a tool, every day is an opportunity to be able to make some kind of impact. And that's all she has. You know, she just has her voice, she has herself, and she brought that into, into the work every single day. And, you know, I think sort of for her, I mean, they really, the family was living in Swat Valley, Pakistan, which is like, you know, middle of nowhere. And, you know, it almost, it, almost like the Oklahoma of Pakistan, you know? And, um, and, you know, they were thrust into this global spotlight. And what they did was to then turn that into all of the attention. It was like, great, we have a spotlight, so let's shine it on all these other girls who should be allowed to go to school. And, you know, I think, again, it was sort of how do we translate this into real action? And then how can we influence to be able to change these policies? Now, when you use the phrase borrowed time, it suggests that she feels that her life is still very much in danger. Would you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. I mean, you know, she hadn't been back to Pakistan until just a few months ago. Um, she, they, there was a real threat to her life. The Taliban had, had said that if she tried to come back that they would kill her, you know, certainly that they would kill her family. Um, and, you know, and she still would get threats even when they were living in the UK. They would, you know, they would still hear that there was some sort of, you know, call to try to end her life. Um, and so I think she, you know, the, the whole family was always sort of in this awareness of it could happen at any, at any moment. And so we're just going to continue to live our lives and we're going to use our voices to, to try to shine this light on, on this issue of girls' education for as long as we can. Mm -hmm. And we know what is at stake here, but it, it's, that's, that's just who they are. They can't, they, it's like, they almost feel like there's no other choice here. There's no other option. This is what they were meant to do in their, in their lifetime. You know, it's one thing for um, a teenager to make that decision. Teenagers <laughs> are famously imbued with a sense of immortality, but um, it's a very different thing for a parent of a teenager, especially one who's been so brutally assaulted, to make that decision. So I wonder if you would talk about um, her father, and, but we haven't talked about him. Yes, yes. Um, her father, Ziaudine, um, is one of the most incredible men I've, I've ever met. Um, and, and they very much were a pair. Um, the two of them traveled, because uh, oftentimes her mother would stay with her brothers in the UK. And so the film that came out a year or so ago um, was called, he named, he, named her, he named me Malala. And um, because he really, he really saw this option of, that it was a gift that he had been, been given a girl. And that he really saw her as, um, this, this beacon of hope that was different than how a lot of girls are viewed in the developing world, and particularly in Pakistan. And um, so, yeah, I mean, she very much is her father's daughter. It's very much, he, he was really a, a passionate um, advocate for education. He was a sort of a, the school principal. He was the teacher. And so for her, she grew up in that she grew up in really valuing education, mm -hmm. and so you can see this very like deep connection between the two of them, where they support one another and they feel very much as though they are doing this work together. So one of the things that made her controversial in, in Pakistan, as you know better than I, um, was this idea that she became a darling of the West and she became a proxy for this idea that Muslim societies are so repressive and the men are all brutes. And I wondered. Why do you think the story of her father didn't dissipate? Well, I think, I think that, I mean, she really was the, f the focus for, yeah. for much of it, the spotlight. It was her name. It was her on the cover of the book. You know, it's her face on the, the, the movie And it was poster. she who was shot. She was <laughs> the one who was shot. Um, 
I mean, you know, before the term alternative facts, they were definitely operating on this. I, I mean, there was the there was you know rumor that she that it had all been a lie that she hadn't actually been shot mm -hmm. that she was just this puppet of the West and that she was being used and that it was you know that they this was all propaganda and they and the Taliban actually used Malala as a tool to recruit mm. um, to say look at what the West is doing and we need to we need to not only kill Malala but kill any girl that is going to be used by the West um, that's going to try to go to school and so um, yeah I mean it is a really interesting um, sort of space that, that she inhabits because beloved I mean where, like wherever we would travel yeah. to people would cry, they would hug her, they would be, you know, she was this beacon of hope. Um, but then, you know, the thought of going home, they, they were, I mean, up, literally up until just a few months ago, it was out of the question. And I remember having multiple conversations with her where that's all she would, they would talk about. Her dream was, her role model was Benazir Bhutto. Mm -hmm. um, and her dream was to go back to be the prime minister of Pakistan yeah. someday. And I believe she will. I think yeah. she actually will. But that's, that's all they wanted. Um, I remember we were in LA once and we were in the sort of um, kind of the hills and we were looking up the mountains and her father was just like it reminds me of SWAT like you know they they so wanted to go back and for me growing up in the United States I I through them understood what they had lost that so often we think about um, sort of Muslim and you know Western relationships um, in this framework around 9-11 and it's this, you know, all oh, the Taliban are so terrible and the Muslim, you know, there's something, you know, something radical, right, about this faith. And it's not true at all. They were, people like Malala and her family were the first victims of an ideology that had spun out of control. And all they want is to be able to go home. That's all, that, that's all they want. They're not trying to escape some terrible place. They're just under the rule of folks who have, really subverted the faith from what its what its basis is, which is peace. You said that she, you didn't mention anything about building schools in Pakistan. Having much interaction in Pakistan was, was difficult. Um, they sent some money back to support, there was a major flood that happened that summer, and so they sent some money back to a particular school that her father had relationship with the sort of administration there, but it was, the infrastructure was challenging in part because um, of the uh, of the that she was not popular within her own country. What's next for Malala? Well, she's in school. Ah, <laughs> she's <good>. she's <laughs> at Oxford. Yeah. Um, she's getting That's to right. be a college student, like so many of you. She's getting mm. to actually like you know study and um, make. You know, she has friends. She's on Facebook, so I see her now. Um, <laughs> where you know, there's pictures of her just like in the cafeteria, and it makes me so happy yeah. that she gets to have that experience. Um, when I was with her, she was 15, 16, 17 years old, and. Um, I think that was one of the things that I really recognized is that she was so often in rooms where it was all adults. You know, she was so often that it was, she didn't get to just be a, a kid. And, you know, some of my fondest memories were getting to have, like, dance parties, you know, where we would sort of, like, we'd come back from a big, you know, fancy policy talk or something, and then we would just hang out and play Beyonce <laughs> and get to see her be a, a teenage girl and we talk about shoes and um, things like that. So. To Kailash and the 100 million. So I was not familiar with Kailash's work before going to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony with Malala. Oh, right. He was her co -lawyer. Yeah, they won together. And I think in part because the, um, the Nobel Committee saw the, the beauty in mm -hmm. someone from India and somebody from Pakistan mm -hmm. working on children's rights at the same time, but you know, in very in different ways. And you have this sort of st striking image of the 16-year-old girl with this, you know, man from India who's in his 60s, who's been doing this for 40 years. Mm. And I remember being in the Oslo City Hall during the ceremony and they showed a film about Kailash. And they showed Kailash who kind of looks like an Indian Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> He's very tall, um, busting down doors and t removing kids from these sweatshops and really, you know, I mean, doing the work to really rescue these kids. and. As a child from India, you know, as an adopted kid, I saw myself in those in mm -hmm. those kids. I just kept thinking that could have been my life. If one th one thing had changed, that would have been where I was. But here I am working for Malala in the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. 
And so I just wanted to be a part of Kailash's work. I just sort of felt this like call that I wanted to support him. Could you give a little background on him? Sure. The people and yes. his work? So Kailash Satyarthi um, is from India. He um, has dedicated his life to really trying to end child labor and child trafficking. He was called to it. He was a, a journalist. He wrote for a paper in India and, um, and came to the cause because a, f a friend of his had come to him and said, my daughter has been taken and asked for his help to write a story and asked for his help to kind of investigate wh what had happened to his daughter. And so Kailash, as a young man, I think he was in his mid-20s, um, sort of learned about this issue and really just felt called to try to do something about it. And so they just started doing these raids where they just started um, trying to find, you know, when they would see children who were out begging or who were working, they would try to find them and bring them back home to their families or eventually they created this rehabilitation center, this ashram where the children were able to kind of um, play and go to school and be kids. And, um, and so he spent almost 40 years now doing this work. He's rescued 80, almost 87,000 children um, by doing this work. Wow. And um, it's incredible to, to just, I mean, he's, he's built this incredible sort of, um, this movement, you know, and uh, about 20 years ago, they launched the Global March Against Child Labor, and that was a global movement that led to the ILO Convention 182. Um, Explain what that is. So basically that, that just, it's, um, uh, it's like a UN convention that basically says that all countries that sign on to it agree that there, will, that there won't be any child labor in their countries, and it sets forth um, different ways that they um, sort of track that and the way that they, they fight that. Um, and it's made a big dent. I mean, just uh, less than 10 years ago, it was over 250 million children were in child labor and being trafficked. And now it's 152 million, which is still a huge number. Yeah. But that's a big difference that, you know, the, that the work has, has made. Um, and so, yeah, so he was awarded the, the Nobel at the same time as Malala. And I started working with him uh, formally in January of 2017. How did you get? Oh, you got you met him at the ceremony. I met him, yeah, and and I was looking for some uh, sort of feeling called to do something um, related to India because I actually hadn't been back to Calcutta, which is where I was born, and I was sort of feeling this um, kind of calling to sort of get connected back to my own heritage, and I thought that Kailash might be a good opportunity to be able to connect my own story with with this work that was really meaningful. And uh, they were launching the 100 million campaign, which is a youth empowerment campaign. And they were looking for someone to lead it in the United States. And so it sort of fit well in that it allows me to, to work on something that is tied to India, but also is in my wheelhouse because of my domestic political experience here in the United States. 100 million campaign? Yeah, so the 100 million campaign is a five-year campaign. Um, it is focused on the 100 million most marginalized children. And the idea is that um, we're asking for young people, we sort of target youth between the ages of 13 to 25, to really take this cause on as the cause of their lifetime. That, that the end of our belief is that, you know, in the next 20, 30 years, if we all really take this on, that we could end child labor and child trafficking. And that we, we all are committed to trying to create a child-friendly world where every child is able to be free, safe, and educated that that's the baseline, that every child should be able to have a childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are building a, a campus network and, and um, you know, high schools and, and trying to bring young people into this movement to really take this on. Kailash talks about it in terms of globalizing compassion and that if young people see themselves alongside those 100 million most marginalized children, that they we can do this together, that we can really say that we're we're not going to allow for children to have anything other than a childhood where they're able to go to school, they're able to be free, and they're able to be safe. I wondered if that movement has interacted at all with the recent marches and protests in India around the child rapes. In the fall, actually, um, Kailash launched the Baharat Yatra, which is a march, um, and they marched across all of India really um, really trying to get the word out about sort of child sex abuse in particular um, because it's something that isn't talked about in, in India and there's been 
a lot of really public stories related to rape and to the trafficking of, of children. And so really he took this on and, and um, you know, and, and the march was very successful, but also, um, you know, that uh, Prime Minister Modi also took this on as something that mm. he was going to make as a policy platform for his own work in the Indian government. Interesting. Let's talk about the 2016 campaign mm -hmm. and then maybe um, mm -hmm. Me Too and the Democratic Party mm -hmm. now, which all are things you're involved in. So, mm -hmm. How does Bernie fit into <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. this range of people that you've been working with? Yeah, Bernie was post Malala, pre Kailash. Um, I was, I, you know, I, I've obviously been in, in, involved in, in both of the campaigns under President Obama. And, you know, sort of as I was getting towards 2016, I was like, I think I'm tired. I think I'm going to sit this one out. And then. Um, you know, life just kind of opened up in a way, and I, I thought, okay, well, like, let's just see. And I honestly, I didn't know much about Bernie Sanders before I started working for him. I had a few friends from the Obama White House that had gone to go work on his campaign. And I, I went into it slightly skeptical, uh -huh. I'll be honest. You know, yeah. there was a little part of me that was like, well, it actually kind of felt like 2008, where I was right. like, well, you know, the likely nominee is Hillary Clinton. Right. <laughs> and Yeah, I was trying. Um, <laughs> And, you know, he's kind of, I, I'm drawn to his policies. I think that there's, you know, um, he was addressing classism which, and income disparity, which I think is really one of the major issues of, the, of our time in the United States. And that sort of called to me, he was talking in a way that was much more radical than, you know, I had sort of been, he couldn't, socialism was a dirty word. You weren't yeah. supposed to say those things. And he was saying it and saying it sort of proudly. So I just decided, okay, I'll go help this guy and sort of see what, what, where that takes me. But again, was like, eh, you know, it's gonna be Hillary, but I'll just kind of do this. And then I, I took on this role where I was doing, I was crowd advance. So I was on the road with him and I, we were traveling and changing cities every three days. And I kept witnessing people who knew every word to his speeches, who felt, um, who were really like, he was speaking directly to, to them in a way that I hadn't seen since 2008 Obama, really. And the crowds were bigger. I mean, my largest crowd was 35,000 people in Brooklyn. And that was a week after there had been nearly 30,000 in Manhattan. Mm. So, you know, and it was like something's happening here. I mean, it, it caught me by surprise. But there was, there was clearly he had tapped into a cultural moment that people were really looking for someone to take these issues on. And what I kept seeing was that, I mean, the, the media would talk about it as it was all just white men that were, that were attracted to Bernie. And what I was seeing with my own eyes was not that at all. It was actually some of the most diverse crowds I had witnessed. It was people from all different backgrounds, different races, um, who were coming together around these policies. And Bernie was speaking directly to them in a way that I just, I really hadn't seen. Why do you think that the media representation of this campaign was that, right? The, the rap was that young people of color in particular were not interested in Bernie. And mm -hmm. so why, if, if that's different than your experience, why do you think it was framed in that, those ways? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the media often has a thesis <laughs> that it then looks to try to prove. And so to seed a good story, it was, I think, easy to sort of say, here's Hillary Clinton who has, you know, women supporting her, um, has sort of the, you know, second wave feminists, and then also, you know, younger women and people are, and also sort of, you know, the Obama folks were, were rallying behind her. And here's this older white guy <laughs> who was, you know, was supposed to not really be, again, like not really, not supposed to win, not supposed to, who was attracting, you know, supporters and getting energy. It was easier to talk about that and try to see divisions if it was gender based, mm -hmm. I think. Mm. Um, I think it was easier to just say, oh, it's just the Bernie bros. And that's why they're not getting on board with Hillary is because they're deep down their sexes. And some of that is true. Mm -hmm. Some of that is true. And those folks, unfortunately, were oftentimes the loudest voices in the room. Um, but it was deeper than that. It was more complicated than that. It was, um, there were policy differences that were very key that when you want to get into policy nuances, the media doesn't like that because it's 
hard. <laughs> it's hard to talk about that. It's hard to understand yeah. that. Um, and also you have to then talk about things like income disparity. You have to talk about the fact that there is this massive wealth gap. And that is, that doesn't feed a good story. And a lot of the folks who are making news are owned by corporates, right? They're owned by folks who don't want to have those conversations. So it was easier to just dismiss it as this sort of, this is just a movement for, you know, sort of Bernie bros, um, than I think it was to really delve more deeply into what was happening there. And, you know, I think there was a real wave of populism, in part because folks really felt like the system had abandoned them. And, you know, for better or for worse, Trump rode that wave as well, and rode was bet both Bernie and Trump were better able to tap into the cultural rage that people were feeling than I think um, Secretary Clinton was able to because she had a woman doing this for 40 years is sort of trained to have to try to make you know like keep a certain perspective of we're gonna be okay, we're steady, I'm strong, I can be a leader in this way, and not, you can't show that you're angry as well, or you get cast as being sort of a harpy, or you know something that, that isn't about the policy, but more about you as a woman. And yeah. Most often, those who've controlled state power have been controversial, and most recently, the rescinding of Aung San Suu Kyi's mm -hmm. um, Nobel Prize from a moment when she didn't have state power to, to one where she did. Um, is, an, is an interesting example of mm -hmm. that. So we're coming to the end, and I guess what I wanted to ask you was, um, with all of this, uh, A, it, this, is a, this is a dark time. It's the age of Trump and you know, Duterte and Modi and you know, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of pretty frightening leaders, mm -hmm. Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. um, how do you maintain hope and how do you think constructive change happens? Small questions right, right. <laughs> to close on. So I'm even getting prepared today to come and talk, you know, I mean I was I was watching the news related to Gaza and you know, I mean it's it's heavy. Like we are we are living in heavy times. And I actually wrote down the quote that's in the lobby of Rockefeller. Um, that it's essential that we enable young people to see themselves as participants in one of the most exciting eras in history and to have a sense of purpose in relation to it. And he said that in 1930. Mm. So what that tells me is that that is true in every era, in every time. And what I'm seeing, when you think of 1930, that's the year after the big crash of 29, right? And what Rockefeller is saying is that it's, you know, it's young people who are going to take this on and who have to feel a connection to the work to right this country to get it back um, onto stable ground. And that is what I'm seeing every day here in the United States and through my work with the 100 million campaign. I'm seeing that activism. I'm seeing folks who are saying, not on our watch. Parkland. Um, yeah, exactly. Parkland is. I mean, that, you know, that to see it here in the United States, that it's, it's young people who are finally pushing for some real change on an issue that I think a lot of adults had kind of given up on. I mean, I will admit that, you know, after um, Newtown, I thought, well, that's it. If, if, if you know, if the yeah. U.S. government, if, if Americans can watch elementary school children being gunned down and murdered and nothing changes, well, then that's it. Right. I mean... And to see that it's that Parkland, that it is high school students who are saying, nope, we're taking this on, and that it's actually starting to shake the trees, tells me that Rockefeller was onto something in 1930, and that it still rings true today to this moment. And that is where I really do find that hope. But it is about staying engaged. Um, I, part of the reason why we're you know, in the position that we're in is so many people didn't vote in the 2016 election. And you know, you mentioned I ran for office, I ran for state senate, and I did that in part because, as a young woman of color, I felt really called to say, you know, I'm not running away. You will see me. I will be at your table, um, and we are going to we're going to fight for our country. And that I really believe is what I, I hope folks can hold on to when everything feels chaotic and a bit dark. Um, is that. We can do it, but we, ha we have to do it. You have to do the work. You have to stay engaged, and it is possible. And the three folks that I've worked for 
have proven that. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you, Mr. Remarkable Activist. Thank you.